Okay, so welcome again to the, the future audience that's watching this. <clears throat> so I'm just going to introduce uh, Medea briefly to everybody. It's a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization. Our mission is to have programs like this to, to bring together the region's technical, scientific, and, and technical workforce or industrial workforce by having programs on entrepreneurship, business finance, and um, develop and, and technology and operations and bring people together to collaborate. So uh, our next uh, meeting is January 9th. Um, it's pre pre presenters TBD, but uh, we'll get that nailed down soon and let everybody know. Um, we are gonna participate again in the Monrovia Holiday Parade, which is basically, which is um, December 1st and dress up in your best um, engineering, biology, biology, tech, lab coat, whatever you want to wear. And we go, go up and down the uh, Myrtle Avenue and we share candy with, with the young parade walkers. So it's just a good time to enjoy the evening and participate in the community. We're also going to be starting, and I'm not sure if it's going to be next week or some other time, work from work from home Wednesdays where people who are working for tech companies, but they're working remotely, um, can get together locally and meet up with other tech work, other workers that are remote and, and kind of build a sense of community, even if you're working for a San Francisco company or a San Luis Obispo company or something like that. Um, so if you have any feedback on this program or future programs, you can email us at email at mediatech.org. Um, after we're done here, we're going to, uh, if, if you want to hang around and have another, have a, some additional refreshments, we're going to go across the street and to Cabrera. So just stick around, we can do that. Um, with that, I will move to our presenter, who is Chris Kimball. Chris has 40 year, a 40 year career with Fortune 500 companies including IBM, Motorola, Waste Management, and GE. He has a passion for sustainability, business development, and real estate. In 2019, he has helped diversify and grow ABC by ABF by 4X. And he's married for 32 years, has two grown children, and recently became grandfather. So, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Applause already. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the audience and uh, and the invitation, and uh, I'm going to try to share a overview of electrification, uh, the ecosystem, and what makes up that ecosystem. Um, I think it's a misconception that electric is one dimensional, and it really isn't. It's uh, it's made up of a whole spectrum of companies, technologies. Um, manufacturers, users, utilities. So we're gonna cover all of that tonight. So um, I picked this picture because um, it sort of represents the fear, at least in my mind, of what a lot of people see when they, when they think about electrification. So that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, and it's not a selfie by the way. So, <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. So I'm. we all grew up with the who, what, when, where, and how. So I'm going to kind of focus with that uh, theme. So we're going to start with, you know, why is this becoming a, 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 an issue? What, why are we seeing this? Why is, you know, three quarters of the advertisement on the Super Bowl focused on electrification and, and EV vehicles? And, and what's actually driving this? Uh, what is electrification? Why is there so much news about it? Um, how can we engage with it? Um, and who, who do you need to engage with to, to become part of that ecosystem? And then who are the, and where is the early adoption gonna occur? Um, so I am going to introduce myself again. Is it a delay or? Okay, there we go. So I'm not gonna focus on this much other than to say, uh, I'm driving strategy for our company, and we're a C10 and a general contractor specializing in electrification. Um, if anybody has any questions for me specifically, I uh, can meet you at the bar across the street. Uh, so this is what's driving uh, the ecosystem. So we've got, a we've got four basic components. 
We've got technology, regulation, application, and finance. So in terms of the technology, uh, the biggest issue um, over the last probably 10 years has been battery technology, which meant how far can I get my vehicle from point A to point B? You were talking about the LEAF earlier. So the LEAF was sort of the first generation of EV, 60, 70, 80, 90 miles. Mm. <laughs> if you used your AC, it went to 45. So forgetting the EV1. Uh, the EV1 was a GM uh, attempt at uh, rolling things out in what 2005, maybe six. It's earlier, been it's, earlier. Five minutes ago. So uh, it was a lease only vehicle. Um, I think they destroyed all of them at the end of the lease for some reason. I'm not sure. Whole, I grew up in Detroit, so I should probably know more about the history of that. I think there's one in the Peterson. Yeah. It's so, the original name was the Impact. Oh, really? <laughs> no, it's probably not. So, the, <laughs> so the, the technology really has advanced very quickly. Um, so now we have range anxiety declining, adoption increasing. Um, I think what you're going to see in probably the next 12 months is um, a, a deluge of product coming out of the market, sub 30,000. Um, dollar vehicles that make it much more um, adoptable for the uh, the masses, if you want to call it. But early adoption has already occurred. We're moving into the next phase of a five phase um, adoption process. Regulation is driving a lot of the um, issues. Uh, California obviously has has adopted a 2035 mandate for new vehicles being sold. That will drive uh, adoption. And it's not just the 2035, they've got a 2030 um, rate. I think it's 50% by 2030, 100% by 2035. So application, we've got three vehicle types. We've got light duty, which we're all familiar with, medium duty, which is the Amazon delivery vehicles, the box trucks that are working from uh, the port into the Inland Empire for drayage. Uh, and then we've got the heavy duty vehicles, the Peterbilts and the, uh, the Volvos and the large 18, what we know is 18 wheel trucks. Um, the finance piece. So we've got most recently NEVI, which is the National EV Infrastructure Act, which will be paying for somewhere around 80% of EV installations up to a million dollars within a mile of major corridors. Big money. You've got um, local utility rebates that are out in the market for multifamily, uh, gas stations, office parks. Um, not a lot for individual homeowners, um, but mostly for mass use um, out in the market. Uh, so there's a lot of different business models that are um, out in the market. Um, you've got CapEx projects that can pay for a project. If, you, if you're a manufacturer, you want to push that out into the marketplace. Uh, there's, we call it uh, transportation as a service or charging as a service. Um, in charge is doing some of that work. Um, and then if we look at the ecosystem, this is really where we became very active in the EV market, realizing that the, um, the integration of a device into an ecosystem or realizing how broad the ecosystem is, is the critical piece that will move toward adoption. So if you look at these boxes, you can see public charging, utility demand issues, EV charging manufacturers, utility incentives, these are all pieces of the ecosystem, all with stakeholders, all with motivations. We were talking earlier about um, utility rates. The utilities are obviously a stakeholder in driving uh, adoption. They're gonna make money on the sale of electricity, not just to homeowners, but to businesses, to the, the vehicle charging companies that are out in the marketplace, like the gas stations now, we will have public charging where you'll be able to pull in, charge your vehicle, pull out, okay? 
um, the ecosystem really is what um, is the connectivity between the manufacturer to the vehicle, to the charger, to the solar, to the battery storage, all of those things as they connect to the grid, create that bigger piece uh, of the story. So we're talking, the, the charger itself is just an appliance. It literally is just a delivery mechanism um, to take electricity and put it into the car. Very simple device. That's the easy part. The more difficult part is moving the electricity from where it's produced to where it's needed. We have a lot of energy in, in both the state and across the country. What we don't have the ability is to store it or to move it to where it's needed. We produce it uh, in the mountains, um, in the uh, Bonneville, uh, Bonneville River, solar, um, and then we can store it, but that distributed storage system is not as mature as it needs to be. So anybody, anybody has solar on their home? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was a that the theory on solar was it was a distributed generation strategy. So instead of the utility generating all the electricity, you divide it up into little pieces and put it out on those homes. The next generation of this is distributed storage. You take storage, which we don't have a lot of, divide it all up, put it out at everybody's homes, at businesses, and now it becomes. Uh, a part of the story. If you arbitrage and download that energy at night where it's cheap and then deploy it back or put it back into the system during the day, you now have a system that's elastic. You're taking it in when it's available, pushing it back into the market when it's needed. Um, question. How many chargers will need to be deployed every day to meet the demand in the next 10 years? In the US or in California? US. More than, more than we want. 100 million. 487 a day. How many total? I believe it's. You can, you can yeah. Somebody do the math. 555,000 by 120. So it's scale. Let's put it that way. No, every day for eight years. Uh, yep. Are we close to that rate? No. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, so the issue, the issue with uh, electrification is that it, we've hit tipping point on the sale of vehicles at five percent. Oh and we'll see significant growth over the next three, four, five years. Um, the demand, and I think that it was mentioned earlier that most of the fueling, most of the charging is going to occur at home or at the workplace. So it will be endpoint destination or starting point um, charging. Um, between the, the location, and we're talking really talking mostly about light duty vehicles. The demand for charging out in the wild is going to be primarily driven toward medium duty and heavy duty. That is really where the big demand is going to be in the next eight, seven, eight years. That's going to be the big growth. Um, air quality issues at the port are driving it. Um, the ability to move. Does anybody know the term drayage? So the drayage is basically the picking up of the container at the port and taking it to the first level of distribution center in the Inland Empire, Bakersfield. Those are big hubs. So they bring in the container, one container on one truck. That's the drage. So you, they loop every day. They, they have probably you know, 60, 70 miles. They can charge in the port, then they can charge at their destination. Charge at the port, charge. They might do three or four loops a day. And then that that is driving a lot of the um, the demand for electricity at the port and inland empire. So that's you've got light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty. That that would be considered more of the medium to medium heavy duty. 
-hmm. How long does it take to quick charge an 18 wheeler trailer? So there's three com three components to charging. One is how big is the battery, how big or capacity of the charger, and how full is the battery. So the battery typically you don't want it to go below below 20 percent, and it has a a governor once it hits 80 percent. So it'll charge very quickly up to 80% and then it begins to flatten out. So if you've ever seen a new EV owner who's sitting at the charger for an hour, hour and 20 minutes, hour and 30 minutes, waiting for their fuel or their, their level of charge to get, they haven't realized yet that you can be in and out in 20 minutes and get 80%, go do your, your driving, come back when it's 20 and go to 80. So you want to you want to stay in that range, or you make people really angry by sitting. There. <laughs> so um, kind of touched on this. Um, I do want to, anybody know the term virtual power plant? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to touch on a little bit. Um, I talked about uh, distributed storage. A virtual power plant is the ability to use software and technology to aggregate distributed storage, meaning a thousand batteries at 20 kW, you can aggregate those up and push them back into the grid. And that's what I, the right I, slide? We, we can we can move we quickly closer. through this because I want to I want to get to this slide um, to make my point about VPP. Oh I don't even know which one that is. That's uh, the Elon Oh, okay. Let's yeah. let's move to that slide because I'm slowly through these. These these are use cases and what's going on with uh, with the manufacturers. But this is this is really the one that I wanted to, with with all the technology pieces that you guys are um, that you've touched on. Anybody have an opinion about this guy? <laughs> Anybody who doesn't? Right, right, exactly. So. We're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get multiple opinions about this general gentleman, um, but I, I want to focus on his vehicle um, company for today. But um, <laughs> that that vehicle right there, what you guys see is a is a is a vehicle to to move somebody from one place to another. What he sees is a battery on wheels. What he's done is he's taken that vehicle and you've all heard of the power wall? Probably. The power wall is another component. It's the same thing, only it's at, at your home. It's a battery on wheels and it's a battery at your home. The virtual power plant is his plan to aggregate that battery and the battery at home to arbitrage energy. He's gonna buy energy at eight or nine cents at night and deploy it and sell it back to the utility, which is us, at $2 a kilowatt hour. And he can do it, and he's done it in the last 30 days. He pulled up five megawatts in a virtual power plant in California. That's too high of a cost. Uh, you're you're not, not currently paying, well, Edison charges $0.08 cents plus solar fees, so it gets up to maybe... 27 cents for us. Your what we were charging at going up north was 43 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. And so I don't I can't see him selling at two dollars a kilowatt hour. He'll get he'll get whatever he wants at six, eight hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Because the utility can't afford to have a blackout. So they will pay whatever it takes. So there's peaker plants, which are regional plants that get turned up when they need to. They're very inefficient, but they create a backup system for the grid. So this is a supply and demand arbitrage strategy, and it's not just him that's doing it. Uh, there are what are called community choice aggregators, and they are doing the same thing as a business model at the local level. You know, so, Monrovia just... They went so community. They with yes. the same power lines. So it won't start until 2024. But this is this is the way the the community choice aggregators are the way the utility makes the 
demographics more specific. So it's very difficult to create programs for a demographic the width of, of PGE or you know SCE. Very difficult. So the community choice aggregators make that audience much smaller. So they can define programs that are adaptable to a much more defined demographic. So that's that's the, the goal of the community choice aggregator. And there are 24, maybe 25 now with Monrovia joining. Uh, Monrovia is joining with the Clean Power Alliance, which has, I think, now, I guess will be, I think they've got 34 member cities. Mm -hmm. It will be 35, I think. That's Clean Cities? Clean Power Alliance. Okay. CPA. Okay. Uh, and, the, and those cities are stretched across San Diego. <laughs> And Ventura uh, area, so it's okay. this sort of stretch of Southern California. So we're we're at, at, go ahead. I'm sorry. Is Musk taking electricity out of cars that belong to his customers and do it with their knowledge or without their knowledge? You can opt. It's an opt in, opt out. So it, it's a rev share. So he will share the revenue with um, the vehicle owner, battery owner. So it's a it's it's a completely software driven um that's why they call it virtual so it's a virtual power plant that he can aggregate so if you opt into this as a customer though you come in and plug in your car thinking you're going to get a charge and in fact it may end up later having less charge in it because the electricity went out of it into the grid well it's very short so everything's everything is measured on 15 minute uh, intervals now so it might be a an eight minute drawdown. It's not a four hour drawdown. It it would be a very you probably wouldn't even notice it um, if if you weren't paying attention. So, so yes, it's like the peaker plant, virtual peaker plant. When there's a heavy demand and there's the and you may have a blackout, they kick in. Yeah. yeah. So it's event driven. So you're going to know ahead of time, hey, we've got 80, 80 degree, 90 degree, 100 degree weather. We know when those brownouts and blackouts are coming. Um, they don't automatically just, you know, pop up. Um, it is one of those things that um, you can plan for. But when you, it's like going to your bank account and needing $100. If that $100 isn't there and you need it, you look for alternatives. And that's exactly what's going on. It's as separate from community green, but community solar is programs where people set up local solar fields. It seems to me they would be a better contractor with these distributed batteries because they're already distributed with solar and they could offer discounted power to the user to charge the batteries and have access on grid demand um, rather than you know Elon Musk particularly. But, <laughs> Well, I think I'm using Elon as a as an example. He's figured it out. There are other people that are doing it. Uh, we are actually participating in pilots in Northern California with um, CCAs that are buying what what they call zombie houses, which are abandoned houses. They're upgrading them with um, smart appliances to drive the demand down. Then they are um, putting panels in that they control along with battery storage and solar. So they're creating their own little mini grid in a, in a home, ultra, ultra um, efficient. And then they tie that to uh, a program where they can now measure uh, the utilization and be able to participate in a VPP. So it's not just Elon Musk. He's just been the most successful thus far in aggregating because he recognized that if he pushed out the battery, which is why he put why he's pushing the battery system so hard into the market, because he can now he now has a captive audience to be able to pull that energy. So this is so this is where we were talking about um, the zombie homes, the smart homes. Uh, the grid management is being able to move the energy up and down when it's needed from the ISO to the local utility. Um, commercial buildings are, has anybody heard of bi-directional batteries? Bi-directional batteries are what 
uh, the, the name of being able to pull the energy off the vehicle. So you need to be able to go both directions as opposed to just from the charger into the battery. You need to be able to pull energy off the battery in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. There's only a couple of vehicle charging companies that have that technology. Ford, Ford Lightning is the, Ford Lightning is the, is the most recent uh, major manufacturer to launch. But the car also has to be capable of it. I know Kia has. That yes, feature. yes. The vehicle and the, the battery within the vehicle, there has to be some talking back and forth uh, from a technology standpoint to be able to communicate the, the plus and the minus. Um, the other big opportunity is school buses. School buses have very large batteries. They have known routes and they have known times that they're being used. So they become a huge opportunity for the ecosystem to act as backup storage um, in the same way that the, the Elon Musk strategy, the VPP. Um, now schools can take advantage of that arbitrage where they can charge at night, use the vehicle from seven to nine to get the students to school. Then during the day, it becomes a, a part of the generation of electricity for the grid. But during the day is when you don't have the challenge because the solar is coming in. What happens in darkness? So the prop the the <laughs> oh stop the speaker. <laughs> so I know that a lot of people think that, and I, I want to respect the comment. Um, but, but about 20% of our electricity comes from solar right now, depending on which which market you're in. Um, obviously, we want to get that up as much as we can, along with other natural occurring um, sources. Um, but to your point, wind dies down at night, and last time I checked, solar goes away at night, kind of by definition. Right. So power plants operate in what they call spinning reserves, okay? You can't turn up or turn down a utility generator. It doesn't work that way. So what we what we do is we have a bell curve of demand during the day. So it goes up and then it goes down. All of that energy right now gets grounded. And that's an electrical contracting term. Basically, we throw it away. We put it in the ground. So we make plenty of electricity, more than we would ever need with exactly what we've got today. What we don't have the ability is to store the extra energy that when it's not needed. So that's where the distributed storage story is coming in, both at the utility level, the home, the business, the bus, all of those become a part of solving the problem that you just defined. And the criticality of having a distributed power play of them is because our battery technology is so poor we don't keep very much in one place. So if we could tap into all these little ones, because we can't well, go into one big one because there isn't a big one that's holding right like, now. Exactly. Oh, okay. You have like 30 school buses, you guys that are all parked there. So that would kind of be a that would kind of be a medium sized one. Yeah. The utilities yeah. have utility scale battery storage, the size of this building, size of 10 of these buildings. They actually have that today. Anaheim is very aggressive in battery storage. SCE is getting there, PGE is more aggressive. San Diego is probably in the middle. So it's happening, it just doesn't happen overnight. And I'll, as, an, as an example, um, when Henry Ford rolled this first model T or A, T. probably. I'm not sure T. T. So he rolls the model T off the line, right? Did he worry about the gas stations on every corner? No, he rolled the car off the line and said, Rockefeller is going to figure it out. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're moving all these vehicles off the line. We're getting them there, but the infrastructure is going to have to catch up to it. It's very organic. I mean, it's going to be it, it's going to be market driven. It's going to be investor driven. It's going to be regulatorily driven. And the finance piece is really critical. The business model. So yes. 
I can't imagine there's enough lithium or, or availability of lithium to create all the batteries. So is there other battery technology out there or upcoming that's going to allow us to store all this energy? Yes. So solid state, so circuit driven battery storage is occurring. It's being piloted. It's, I mean, you guys probably know more about it than I do in terms of uh, progression, but lithium, lithium batteries will at some point go away. There will be better storage strategies. Um, a of life. I mean, if I'm looking at a school bus and you, let's say it will run 120,000 miles on a battery, you know, and you're using it every day, mm -hmm. like from 20 to 80 all the time. Yep. It's going to wear out. It what? does wear out. And then there are what they call second life battery, mm -hmm. uh, where you take it out of the car and then you use it as battery backup for a building when you don't have as many cycles running. Okay, so there are strategies. The batteries don't die each, each um, what's the word, um, component of the battery does not die right. equally. Right. So if you take a battery, it's got, you know, let's say 16 um, so uh, I'm losing cells. more cells. Thank you. Um, you got 16 cells. Maybe only three of them have, have been um, taken to end of life. So they pull the three, put three new ones in. Now you've got a recycled battery. Obviously, you've got a, a waste issue as well. So there are a lot of theories around uh, where the carbon um, issues are being addressed. Are you just moving the carbon from uh, the end state to the you know, further up the chain, I would say yes, uh, but I think those things are being addressed. Um, I have a one last question. How many years did it take uh, for the U.S. to go from horse to vehicle in, in mass? How many years? See, my, my father was a chauffeur in 1910, <laughs> driving a horse. I think. No, he was, he was doing vehicles. 13. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13 years to go from a full horse and carriage to majority internal combustion engine. 13 years in the U.S. In urban areas. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, 13 they, years. that's what they're planning on, I guess. Well, I think that, I think when you look at, when you look at what Gavin Newsom has done in 2022, and you add 13 years, guess what year you get? <laughs> right? I mean, that's, it, it's not, it, it's not unfounded. It doesn't, it, it has historical context. So let's talk about, um, this is this. I'm probably in. way over. Buddy. I'm way over. So these are, these are the players, right? There are a lot of people working on this. I mean, it's massive. You get you know from in charge. You know how many players there are in in this ecosystem. We are one of. We are an integrator. That's how we define our company. There are more and more and more integrators coming onto the market. It is the activity is working with all of these pieces to figure it out. Because what I get on any given day is, hey, I wanna put charging in, how do I do it? Right, it's, it's, it's not as simple as, oh, well, I'll bring it out and install it. Because even if you install it, it doesn't mean that the utility is providing power to power. All the EV charging uh, requires different voltage. You've got level one, 110 with your leaf, you've got 220, which is the level twos, and you've got 480, which is the superchargers required for delivering at 20 kW or above. So a typical Tesla charger is 125 kW and, and going up. So it's it, the even if you install it, doesn't mean that that power is available. Which is kilowatts for anybody you, in high school. Sorry, kilowatts. Um, um, adoption is going to happen in different ways. So it's going to be driven regulatorily. It will be driven by demand. It will be driven by uh, money availability, business models. So we we do a what they call a TCO third um, 
it's TPO, sorry. TPO is third party owner. So we can go to a mall. And if we believe that that mall will generate enough utilization, we will pay for the installation of all the infrastructure, the charging, and then we'll, we will own and operate that as a tenant landlord kind of relationship. That is what uh, Electrify America, EVgo, Tesla, those are all third party owner structures. There's another layer down below that, which includes companies like ours that are doing third party owner at different at a different use case than a Tesla. Tesla is a lily pad where every 60 miles they're putting 20 or 30 chargers in. We'll put four in, four, four, four. So it's a slightly different model, but the adoption is occurring um, very different. Go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to shut me up. <laughs> so so the, the, adoption, the adoption obviously is occurring along the coast in the West. Right. And that is so red is good in this case. Yeah. When you turn California red, some of us get nervous, but I'm saying, uh, red. Too soon. Too soon. Um, so the, this is really what's occurring. And you can you can blow this up to a, a uh a global view as well. You can see the same exact patterns in a lot of um a lot of European cities and countries. And then you blow it up, and then there's blue, 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 red, 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 and everything in between worldwide. So we follow the gas prices because we have the highest gas prices in the country. And by the way, you know, electric is a hell of a lot cheaper than six dollars a gallon. So we call that total cost of ownership. <laughs> total cost of ownership is the vehicle plus the maintenance plus the fuel, and and you divide that by the number of miles, right? You can do it with diesel, you can do it with gas. We did it as we, we did it when we bought our first car, right? I can buy a, a small car, it uses very little electricity or very little gas at the time. Um, and my TCO is affordable, or I can buy a really big truck and pay a lot of money for gas and a lot of money for tires. Total cost of ownership that divided by the number of miles, all of a sudden my choice goes back toward. What can I afford? I'm pointing out it's regional because two dollars a gallon will still buy you in some states. You can still get gas for two dollars a gallon, and, and or three dollars a gallon. Yeah. You're paying six and seven. So, so more incentive here to put in electric cars. It, electric it, that's an interesting. I, I'm you can. I, I, I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm going to take the same approach. I respect the position. I would make the case that it's just the opposite. That it's not it's not the cost of energy that's driving electric. It's the electric electric being motivated by the cost of energy. That's so the politicians are the cost of gas is really high in California, but for of, but for a lot of different reasons. Right, but but the point is, uh, the trip we just took, which is six hundred miles each way, would have cost. Several hundred dollars mm -hmm. in gas costs. Mm -hmm. It cost forty three dollars, I think, right? Or a hundred of them. Uh, significantly cheaper by all electric. Yeah, I, that's where we're going. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yes, I, 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 I'm not sure we can. Let, why don't we continue the conversation over at the bar? Because <laughs> that that sounds like a good conversation. Matt, where is it now getting instituted? Is it related? If I have a state where I've got low gas costs, why should I be? Why should I switch to electric? Delphi has low gas costs. Right. <laughs> Every, right. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, compared like, to us. Yeah. No, I would say that regulations are now catching up. Incentives, the 7,500. I think there's also the charging infrastructure is getting out there. But I think part of it is, and I think what you were getting at is there's not only can you get the 7,500 and the 2,500 here tax rebates on buying an electric vehicle, there's also regulations driving up the gas prices. So you've got all these things pushing towards. There is a, a there is a, 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 there is a political component. Yeah to driving up energy costs. Mm -hmm. I think we can probably yeah. all agree that there is a piece of it. We could argue about what piece that makes up, 
but the reality is there is a political piece of it that's driving it. And but if you look back in the 70s and 80s year when the smog was so bad, <laughs> I mean, they had to do this. They had to start cleaning up and that, yeah. but it was before electricity. Yeah. Like, that's why our gas is more expensive. That's, there. I mean, there was so much motivation happening for so many years. And I think, I mean, I would, I you know as a child that we couldn't go out of play. Yeah, we red, red flag. No, we could play yeah. with those of those hurt. No, but I was school, like, we would not let you have recess. Yeah. But we ship gasoline to California and other states. Okay. They sell a lot cheaper. Well, I know that that is because our taxes and everything are driving it up, but they're going to catch up. And those are politically motivated regulations. True. Driven. Or bad, bad choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I argue that. Yeah. 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 You got to go find a plug because you throw them all away. And, and so now you got to get a different plug. I've got a car that I bought in 2017 and it's got the charger that was standard back then. But I went to a, a charger the other day and I was looking for the plug and there was like eight different plugs on this, but none of them for my car. So is my car being kind of Pushed out, you know, is it do now? Am I supposed so, to get a new car now, or you know, there are adapters that I have to yeah. buy? So, <laughs> there, are, there are three common adapters there's Chatamo, CCS, and the Tesla, those are the three majors. Okay, the Leaf is a Chatamo, and that is being reduced, pushed out, obsolete. obsolete made obsolete um the ccs is probably the the standard connector that we will be using going forward what, what kind of it's a bolt because uh, you know so that is that won't work on a fast charger that's a hybrid so that's no, what you must have gone yeah but you, no the it's, bolt or the bolt, bolt. bolt. The yeah that yeah, is no, not an all-electric so that's an all-electric vehicle well, oh, because you don't that, that must be the bolt then, because no, the no, because no, because the drivetrain is all electric. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but it, so it's got a it's got a, a generator on board that if you're yeah. you run out, it, it yes. Charges. So the plug that you have the you must have been at a fast charger. Yeah. And so the fast charger was what it was, was the four eighty. Okay. And so your car can't take in that much power. Yeah. So the CCS plug is is it like a special is basically that you have. Four different plugs on your I know. So you're the, the 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 volt will only take a level two charge, or or level one, right. but it won't take a it won't take a DC fast charge. So for anybody over sixty, are they going to be able to charge their cars? <laughs> Not because they can't plug it in, but they can't figure it out. <laughs> well. I'm 63, and I have trouble with certain things, um, so I get it. I understand. Uh, that's why I bring Dave with me. <laughs> He's so, Dave. We don't hear that story all the time. Yeah. Wait. And to be honest, people who are there's good, there's a place in the market for teaching people how to use this. You know, like with like a gas station, right? The first time yeah. they said you could pour do your own gas, I'm sure a bunch of people were standing around going. <laughs> I, mean, I I do think the automakers are stepping up into that zone right now, and that's where I went the last two days. Chevy was having bringing in all the dealers. They all have to put in DC fast chargers. They have to put in level two chargers. They are getting educated, and that will in turn kind of like you know how you're saying when you're buying a car now, you will know that. Also, I know all these used car places, the automation, yeah. the, all of that. They're all putting into it. We've probably installed 70 auto dealers in the last three, four months because they are they are going to be one of the educational channels 
and, 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 and are as are rental car agencies that yeah. have a real steep curve because if the only thing there is an electric car that's available to rent, somebody's going to take it who doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. And they're so, so, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it was a big announcement. Yeah. I've heard it's kind of AP. I use a, uh, I use an analogy. Um, it's kind of a sports analogy, but um, it basically is about an eight-year-old who goes out and wants to be a basketball player, right? You practice, then you play in a game. At, with other eight-year-olds and then you graduate to high school and then you know you're still playing at a, a much higher level but not pro not and then there are certain people that get to that level we don't turn to our eight-year-olds similar to the model t example we don't turn to our eight-year-olds and ask them why that why aren't you playing in the nba right they're not there yet they need to practice they need to play games they need to practice play with better players and it's all incremental and we are not there yet. We are in the eight-year-old youth basketball league right now. And we're not in the NBA yet. We're getting there. One, one question is kind of takes a good direction is what kind of jobs and what, what kind of talent is your company looking for? Uh, the schools need to produce. Okay. How are we going to backfill? Because these 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 charges don't install themselves. No. Um, so, so how do we get the workforce to do this? So I will, I'll go through, uh, I'll go through our process real quick. We have auditors that need to have electrical background that can go into a site and look at a panel and figure out what's there. Then they report that back. Then we have design engineers that will take that input and do a single line drawing, electrical background. Then we have um, purchasing. They have to know the product. They have to know um, the network. They have to be able to interact with people. So they have to have those people skills. Then you have project managers. You have installers. And often people think about the blue collar job with workforce development, but there, there's a whole spectrum of jobs. Project management, you know, moving up through the managerial train to be able to manage and teach the project managers. Then you've got all the business side, you know, the accounting. It, it's, it is a business. So you need all of those skills. You need an accountant, you need a, um, a, a CEO, you need a, a, everything that a normal business would need for a contractor. Um, in terms of workforce development that we've done, we've done some nonprofit installations where we brought in students to be able to observe exactly what you just, hey, teach me what this looks like. What does it look like to pour concrete? What does it look like to, why, why do you put the pipes in the ground before you, put, well, of course you put them in the ground before you lay the concrete. You know, so there's a, there's a sequence to building something that's a skill. And all of those things need to be learned by 16, 17, 18 year old kids so that they can start figuring out, just like these kids online, they're trying to figure out what they want to do. So there is a workforce development component to what we're doing. And we're actually doing it. And if any of the like community colleges or universities catering to this yet? Or... Mm -hmm. There's some. NorCal, the Davis, I know they are. There, there are some, but I think they're more focused on the uh, the vehicle side. Mm -hmm. the, more of the how do you repair it um, rather than the ecosystem. Very. People focus on a very linear, in a very linear way. Is I'm an I'm an appliance guy. I'm an electrical guy. I'm a utility guy. These are all, or I'm a car guy. These in in this ecosystem, they're all reliant on each other, and that's the piece that that's what I try to tell people is you can't divide this up. It doesn't work if you divide it up. It only works if you have energy supply, energy use, workforce development, users that will buy vehicles. You need the whole thing or it falls apart. On that note. Can you say some more words about your company? I still, I still don't know some of the key things. 
who, who is your customer? Who would call you and say, I need help? Is a little guy, a big guy? What's a typical job size? Do you have 10 customers, 100 customers? Okay. Um, so we are a California-based C10, which is a license type for electrical contractor. Okay. We also are a general, which means we can build pretty much everything and sub all the pieces out. What I did three years ago was reorient our company to be called an integrator. We're an electrification integrator, C10, general construction, but we do we bring all those pieces together. And that's that's what differentiates us. There's a bolt down which would define taking the appliance and, and putting it in and commissioning it in a new construction application. So if you're building a multifamily or a new building, you're gonna lay the conduit, the general contractor and the electrical are gonna lay all the conduit and we would come in and bolt down the equipment and commission it, make sure that it works and communicates because everything's got a cell connection because there's a software backend dashboard component to all of this. So you need to be able to measure all the data and all the electricity that's being used. But I think Tip. John John was asking, you're asking, you guys work for cities, right? Cities hire you guys to do projects. Cities do, but but like I said, we work for InCharge. So InCharge is a program management company. They have customers in Detroit. They negotiate a rollout for GM, and then they call us. We do the audit. We do the engineering. We do the permitting. We do the construction, but they manage us, and we are a regional contractor, and they might have 50 of me around the country rolling out a GM program. Do you work in more in charges, or do you... We, we have we have both. We work for end users that would be considered early adopters, um, a trucking company that says, hey, we, we want to test this. Um, we do the auto dealer programs that are being rolled out. We have, um, we just signed the W Hotel um, in West Hollywood. We're putting five chargers in with that third party owner model. They don't want to be an owner operator. So we we will act as their surrogate. Um, schools. So a lot of it has to do with the use case, um, whether it's level two, you might put 150 chargers in, in a campus, college campus. You probably aren't putting any DC fast in because students are coming there at eight and they're staying there to three. They just need a slow charge. And by the time they're done, they get to go home. So, Sarah, if you have a business model with a third party owner and non owner at the same time, do those compete with each other or do they? It seems like there's like you pick one or the other. You're either one or the other, and you're trying to do both. Is that a, a long term? I don't think so. I think it's, it's, it's selling the same product really to different types of people. But you have to have a back end to manage that owner, that owner so, operator. Yes, but all of those are um, plug-in software type applications. They, I can pull up a master dashboard and see three or four different software backends. So I can I can overlay. So if a char charge point, um, Anel, um, ABB, um, Tritium, all of them have their own. Um, there's no standard backend right now. Everybody has kind of their own software that's either attached or there's a general software and and it's compliant with multiple appliances right so i just i, I think some of the uh, being married to the business so to speak what i know about it is that it's if there's some companies like ev like by america they're an owner operator right yes and and, and charge point is it right right so did they pick completely, they picked one or the other, they didn't pick both. So is there- So EV, Electrify America doesn't make equipment. Okay. ChargePoint makes equipment and software. So they kind of fit into the, in some cases they could compete, but the manufacturers might be competing for Electrify America's business. 
So ABB is the typical manufacturer that sells to Electrify America. But ChargePoint might come and say, hey, we've got a new product. We want to sell our product to Electrify America. And Electrify America says, you're too expensive, or this is great, or we love your software. Yes, we'll now buy your product and we'll install it in New York, but we won't install it in Alaska because it doesn't make sense because it doesn't have the, the specifications to handle cold weather. You know, there's there, it's very, very geographic driven. This is another aspect of electric versus gasoline. When I buy gas, well, I like to buy Chevron, although it's hard to afford these days because the quality of gas is different. The quality of electricity is the same no matter who you buy it from. So the whole mentality of how they compete um, is going to be an aspect of the business. They've got to compete by either have the best the chargers that always work, which doesn't occur yet. <laughs> they, have, they have the charger that produces the fastest charge or the safest charge. So there's a bunch of features like that they can compete with. But uh, unlike gasoline, you, you're not competing against Arco versus Chevron, which some people or Shell used to be garbage gas. Can you buy garbage gas? It's cheap, but you're you're ultimately arguing with down in your car. And there's no high test, right? There's no high test. So there's a whole new economy around electricity selling that I think it is an aspect. And the other thing is what you mentioned, the, the software interface is all over the place. You're downloading six or seven or eight apps. Some of some work reasonably well, some are absolute shit, too. <laughs> but and and you didn't and apologize to me. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I think I think on our trip, we spent several times we were we, we spent more than 20 minutes just getting the charger to start charging, and that included telephone calls to the charger manufacturer and just nothing worked well. So I don't know, what, what do you think in terms of standardization, getting standardization? Just like what he said, right? When I plug up the it's worth a eight year old. I was, I was gonna, I, I, I can see uh, Henry Ford, Rockefeller, seriously, you gotta get more gas stations out there and better gas, I'm telling you. What, you know, I mean, it, we're in that we're in that mode right now where we expect things to go from zero to hundred and be a solvable, I don't know, a solution set. That we're we hundred years into vehicle standardization on the gas nozzle. Right. We know that's a requirement. Why wasn't it done here? It's not like it's new. It's like it's dumb. I think because, like any entrepreneurial experiment everybody's launching different ideas at the same time there's no hey look at betamax <laughs> yeah every computer is what kind of, what kind of phone do you have um android why because <laughs> it's cheaper than apple <laughs> plug doesn't work on my phone <laughs> right i mean you can make the argument that all technology is going to be maturing at different rates. I'm not saying I don't complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, so, just so you know, I started my speech at seven o'clock. At 7.03, I knew about you already. No, it, it, those are great questions. I don't have all the answers. All I know is that this seems to be an ecosystem that's maturing very similar to IT, internal combustion engines, telephone, telecommunication. You can look at all of these different technologies and go, well, IPv4, um, why did we run out of IP addresses? Why didn't somebody think to add four digits to the end of the IP address so that we didn't run out of IP addresses? I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. My, my wife- my, my wife owns IPv6solutions.com because she knows that there's going to be a point where that technology needs to be converted. Yes, sir. Very different question. <laughs> no complaint. It's not been here in the area. But I've read that for electric vehicles, 
it takes, I don't know if it's four or six times more minerals for electric cars. Is that going to be a problem from the production standpoint of being able to meet those requirements of having that many new uh, electric vehicles available? I think you're probably low on the number of X's. Yeah, I think it's a lot more X's. Um, but I also believe that, that there are smart people out there that will figure it out. You asked earlier about different battery technology. I think very quickly we will move to non-Chinese based, uh, you know, lithium plant, you know, production. Um, but it, it has to get to a price point. It can't be this expensive versus this expensive. So going back to the price of gas, the more expensive the gas gets, the better the total cost of operations, TCO, looks on an EV. If gas was at 37 cents, like it was when I was 16 years old, batteries wouldn't take off. EVs would take off. It takes that comparison. Yes. So when are we going to get to the point where we stop burning fossil fuels to make electricity? <laughs> God, these, these yeah, are pretty loaded, loaded questions. Um, Let's buy it in the Midwest for two dollars a gallon. Well, if you check the Midwest lately, it's about four bucks. <laughs> oh, so, so yeah, um, I, I, it's an ecosystem. No, none of these, none of these questions. Yeah, especially like in California, we don't. Burn as much, and it's very you know, government again. They're pushing on that too, right. and and either right now I think it's like if you convert, you get subsidies, and if you and at a certain point it's going to be like if you don't convert, you're going to get penalties. There's one answer I have that all the time is a steady state internal combustion engine or gas driven engine is much more efficient than a stop and go car going down the freeway. They just having to start or stop. So a steady state engine, even if it's natural gas, is less polluting than right. gasoline in someone's car. Right, but, but my question is because you were yeah. talking about like the natural gas. Yeah. Right? So in, in what is it? Pismo, it's it's Pismo. No. Pismo Beach, I think they're getting rid of the natural gas plant. They're they're down there. No, not yeah, down there. Right. So no, it's it's um the beach it's just a little further north. Morro Bay. Morro Bay, thank yeah. you. Uh, and so they're getting rid of that plant and they're going to put in a peaker plant. But they're still going to have a natural gas plant there, but we're still burning. I mean, if we if we if we're going to have so many electric cars here, the demand for electricity has to go up. It's just if everybody has an electric car, you use more electricity. It's just like if everybody turns on their lights, you use, use more electricity, right? But so but we're also wasting a lot of electricity right now. No, right? Uh, like that. Absolutely, just want to say we ground it. Yeah. We ground it. So maybe by putting it in the cars, you know, we could we can store it. I mean, yeah. there's never going to be enough lithium to create all the batteries. I think what is it right now? We have, I think if you if you if you ran the capacity of batteries for the U.S. and you ran the U.S. on batteries, you'd have like two minutes one time. I wouldn't. Be surprised at all? Yeah, I think I, I, was, I was listening. And to next year it'll be four minutes. Right. And right. then a year after that it'll be an hour. So I think that it's a long way to go before we're, like we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're eight years old playing in the MB or the in the back basketball youth league. Yeah. I mean it's just so we gotta practice anyways. We gotta, we gotta practice and we gotta get good and then we get better and then we it's, it's happening though. We had a record that was about what, six months or so ago. There was a brief moment where all the state's electricity came from renewables. No, it was short. <laughs> but but it was just in the beginning. And we're building more in solar all the time. We're yeah. building more wind all the time. We'll get there. But, There's a whole bunch of slides we skipped that showed you those curves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot. Of Give the presenter a big hand for it. <laughs>